So a little about Terry. So Terry is the founder and chief executive officer of Luma Partners, the inventor of the Lumascape. I'm sure we're all familiar with the, with the Lumascape. Terry is an investment banker, you know, kind of sitting at the intersection of marketing, media, and technology. So brands like Uber and Dollar Shave Club um, and um, uh, Untuck It. So who has used brands like that? You know, virtually I would expect every single hand to go up in the room. So these are direct-to-consumer brands. So that's um, the emphasis of Terry's talk today. So please give a warm welcome to Terry Kawaja, founder and CEO of Luma Partners. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. All right, good morning, Orlando. I, I am excited for this one, folks. Uh, for fire your CMO, because marketing's future will not resemble its past. And I, <clears throat> I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. The first question on your mind is why, at a marketing conference, are you listening to an investment banker? After all, we don't have the best reputations. So whatever you think of your day job, I wake up every morning knowing this is what people think of me. But as Bill said, we do operate at the intersection of media, marketing, and technology. So hopefully we have some relevance. Um, and that tends to manifest itself in digital content, marketing technology, and ad technology, and direct-to-consumer brands, a new uh, focus area for us. You probably know us for the Lumascapes, as mentioned. These are now a global media property with over 7 million views and downloads from 211 countries. There are only three known countries that have not viewed and downloaded Lumascapes. Those are North Korea, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which is decidedly undemocratic, um, and Syria. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I have big news. This summer, some poor bastard in Aleppo, bombs falling, downloads a Lumascape, ladies and gentlemen, 212. So, <laughs> I can't explain it. Uh, but our day job, of course, is, is, doing, oopsie, uh, is doing deals. We got a little AV problem here. Uh, hopefully only this slide. Uh, over 300 billion in transactions and counting. Uh, lots more to come. So I'm excited to talk about marketing-driven uh, growth. And you know, normally, when I get on a stage like this at a marketing conference, I end up talking about ecosystem challenges. And there are so many of them, it's like getting tiring. And I have a cohort, the chairman of the ANA, Mark Pritchard, CMO of Procter & Gamble, has almost been my partner in this, going around to every conference, talking from a marketer standpoint about this challenge, about this major problem. And I gotta be honest with you, I'm tired. I don't wanna talk about these problems anymore. Although this being the near the six month anniversary of GDPR, just a quick note on, on privacy, GDPR was enacted on May the 25th of this year. And politicians, regulators, and privacy zealots will tell you that consumers are up in arms about their anonymous data being utilized for purposes of targeting in a marketing context. Well, I'm here to tell you that's not true. That is simply not true. Now, I'm not talking about leaks of PII data like Facebook recently had. That is horrific. That should be addressed, penalized, and those actions should be corrected because that is bad. All players who leak PII should be bad. But anonymous data about your demographics and your proclivities? No, 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 no. I, I get it now. You know the GDPR EU symbol? It's got 12 stars originally reflecting the original 12 countries in the EU. Well, there's now 28 countries in the EU, so it doesn't count for that anymore. I'm pretty sure I know why the 12 stars are there. It reflects the total number of consumer opt-outs out of 508 million. I swear to God, I have got vendor data, I've got log file data. No one is opting out because nobody cares, except for politicians, regulators, and privacy zealots. Well, apparently corporations don't care either, because you could say the 12 represent the 12 billion in M&A transactions that have transpired uh, since GTCR was enacted on May the 25th. So clearly corporates don't care, people don't care. Let's move on, shall we? Uh, big, uh, we'll be watching in California. No, today I am talking about growth, driving growth, which is the theme of today's conference. And I couldn't be happier. 
It's appropriate that we talk about growth because according to the ANA's own research, over half the Fortune 500 companies are simply not growing. They're declining in revenue, earning them a considerably poor report card. You know how to spend the money, you just don't know how to convert the people. So let's see, what could be hindering this growth? Let's see, could it be because we have a down economy? No, no, GDP growth over 4%. Prohibitive interest rates, perhaps. No, 10-year treasury below three. Uh, how about low consumer confidence? No, that's not it. Could it be that marketers and their tactics are old? Ladies and gentlemen, we have a winner. But this is not everywhere. Not all marketers are suffering. Think about direct-to-consumer brands. I know in my own experience, my own portfolio of DTC, I wake up every morning and eat breakfast delivered by a DTC brand. I then don DTC clothing. I'm wearing some right now, uh, later. Uh, 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 I transport to work on a DTC brand. I go to the Hamptons on DTC brands. I do everything on these DTC brands. My luggage is DTC. So our own personal experiences, we know this to be true. But it wasn't until I was in a dark room like this in February when I realized the broader implications of this. And that's when I saw Randy Rothenberg deliver his 21st century brand economy speech at the IAB uh, annual leadership event. This was mind blowing for me where I realized the broader ramifications. And I don't think Randy was overstating things when he said, This is about a fundamental epochal change in the way brands are born, the way they grow up, and the way they die. Speaking of which, um, these brands, these relatively young startups over a short period of time are able to garner double-digit market share in categories where the incumbents had been building brand equity in some cases for decades. This is a major phenomena in marketing. And it's proliferating. Here's our uh, draft attempt at the uh, uh, Lumiscape. Um, over, we have over 300, actually that's data, we have over 350 brands. I suspect this will be over 500 uh, soon. Uh, but this afternoon we are publishing the direct-to-consumer brand Lumiscape. Watch for that, go to lumapartners.com and you can download it. Um, here's uh, Procter & Gamble where one company alone is being attacked. 45 of their brands are being attacked by these DTC startups and that's a dated uh, stat. DT There's good news, DTC brands are going global, or should I say going globally local in England, in Canada, in Germany. In fact, across Europe, South America, and Asia, this phenomena is happening all across the world. Another, perhaps the thing I like the most about this category is the incidence of, okay, I'll let you fix that. Um, the incidence of, AV people, female leadership, uh, incredible, 30% of all founders and CEOs of DTC brands are women. Can we hear it for that? You get, you, get, you get a room like this and three out of 10, I say that's a good start. That's a good start. Go women. Um, all right, but this comes with bad news too. DTC is so effective, it can sell bad products. Ladies and gentlemen, Donald Trump is the first DTC president of the United States and look how that's going. So it's not all good news. Yes, this is not some you know, passing fad uh, that you know, some internet meme that comes and goes. This is real and once marketers see what's going on, it's hard to ignore direct to consumer. Think about it. These DTC brands have more in common with each other than they do with their Ernst Weil vertical competitors. So yes, Allbird sells shoes just like Cole Haan, and Warby Parker sells sunglasses like Sunglass Hut. But I would argue their design sensibilities, their go-to-market strategies, the technologies they utilize to garner new customers make them more in common with each other. In fact, DTC is not the first successful challenger story. We've had David and Goliath stories in marketing on the enterprise side, of course, consumer, heck, even 
Investment banking. Things riddled with ads, don't worry about it. Um, so DTC in 2018 feels like programmatic in 2009. Think about it. In 2009, we had rapid new company formation, fragmented ecosystem, rampant venture funding, nascent consolidation, and a sector poised for huge growth. Well, in 2018, DDC brands, same thing. New company formation, lots of venture, nascent consolidation, and huge growth. We saw how it played out on the enterprise side, right? The good news was we went from zero to 50 billion in revenue. The bad news, largely uh, uh, you know, to the benefit of two uh, companies, the, the duopoly. It will be better on the DTC side because there is no natural monopoly when, you've, when you're cutting across all of those verticals. Now, of course, there is Amazon, which is playing on, on both sides. Amazon cuts both ways. If you're trying to sell a DTC commodity product, like a battery, you're in trouble because they have their own private label. But net-net, Amazon is a huge boon for direct-to-consumer because it's effectively the back-end engine that allows all these DTC brands to focus on the marketing, focus on the customer, and uh, go big. In fact, the digital giants are the biggest DTC brands. If you want to know what your favorite DTC brands are, that's easy. Just pull out your phone. They're right there on your home screen. And call out to Spotify. Great dinner last night, guys. That's where all the cool kids were. Um, OK, so let's unpack this DTC brand phenomena. Um, there are certain conditions, as I mentioned, that led to this phenomena. Yes, the availability of capital, as I mentioned. And of course, there's all this infrastructure. The, the iPhone, without the iPhone and the corresponding app ecosystem, we wouldn't have the DTC phenomena that we do. Uh, AWS, Shopify, Amazon, and even, yes, all the big digital media properties where DTC got their first foothold uh, are really conditions precedent. But perhaps an even bigger uh, 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 leader, the thing, the element that led to this DTC phenomena is our consumer openness to new brands. I don't know because it's, whether it's reviews or what have you, but it feels safe to go in the water. It's okay, let's give it a try. And by the way, this is stark news. This notion of brand loyalty not being as relevant as it used to be should be stark news for people in this room who built their career on the premise of brand loyalty. In fact, this playbook has been run before. If you think about mobile uh, gaming companies in the, in, the, in the aughts, you know, companies like King and Machine Go uh, Zone and Supercell are customer acquisition machines. Think about the P&L of Supercell. Here's their P&L rounded from 2010. A billion in revenue, only 10% to make the game. You code the game, That's, that doesn't cost much. And then the rest of it is all marketing and profit. If on the basis of this incredibly impressive P&L, you were to conclude that Supercell is a great gaming company, you would be wrong. Supercell is a great marketing company. The game is, just happens to be what they sell. So we went from gaming to a broader ecosystem of apps. And so D to C is in fact just the third incarnation along this gestation, along this natural evolution of performance uh, marketing. In fact, it's getting harder. So if you think about gaming, it was one vertical, one demo, digital to digital, which by which I mean they uh, buy media in the digital channel to attract uh, customers, they convert in the digital channel, they deploy in the digital channel, and they track usage in the digital channel. So it's a complete closed loop. Pretty easy, right? You're going after young males and you convert them all. There's no worries about attribution. You don't have to concern yourself with whether the guy saw the ad before they walked on the lot. Um, the app world, now we got multiple verticals and, and a broader set of demos. DTC is basically everybody, right? So it's all verticals. It's, the demo is everyone. And now, for the first time, we break out of digital and we go omni-channel. You've seen Peloton bus shelter ads. You've seen Casper 30-second spots. Digital, while it was born in digital, digital's not big enough to contain it anymore. It has to go elsewhere. And so the end of the day, the closed loop is what they all have uh, in common. So let's take a look at the DNA of DTC. These are the seven elements that we have identified that these companies are doing and doing uniquely. Let's unpack these, shall we? 
uh, digital native mobile center. Warby Parker gets over half their customers on the phone. That's a far cry from where general marketers are today. They have a completely different design element. We all know who the best industrial designer in the world is. It's really important. It's Johnny Ives. And you can tell from the products. The products are amazing. It's not important. Today, it feels it's like really, really, really everything really is being designed by Johnny Ives. The dude has been cloned. Whether it's luggage, what have you, uh, it's all amazing uh, design these days. So Johnny Ives is propagating. Obviously, you've got the disintermediation. That's part of the D and DTC. So marketers are bypassing wholesalers, retailers, agencies, and going direct to the consumer. In fact, some of them are so successful, they're forward integrating into retail. You've seen it. Tesla, Untuck It, Bonobos, Peloton, shops to garner new customers. They take an entirely different approach to advertising. Traditional marketers do spray and pray advertising where they use unknown cookie IDs to you know, blanket the, the marketplace. DTC brand marketers do precise tailored marketing leveraging first party data. They leverage, they then take that sort of technology, add it to it, the identity, the data layer, use AI in order to orchestrate their campaigns in a multi-channel fashion. Doesn't matter, the consumer's everywhere. But, and, and, and AI is super impressive. We're all familiar with the left brain capabilities of the computer, you know, things like propensity modeling and predictive analytics. Well, what's really exciting is the right brain capabilities now of the computer where, you know, AI is writing ad copy. Heck, they're making films. But I will say AI comes with a warning. The first marketing company to call themselves AI rewarded their shoulders with a $2.2 billion stock market capitalization evisceration, perhaps earning themselves a different tagline. Okay. DTC brands think about advertising so differently, they think of it as a profit center. So think about it. The connection between your spend and the results is just CAC math, customer acquisition cost math. It's math, it's straightforward. There's no guesswork. In fact, there is such, so no guesswork. They know the lifetime value of a customer. They know exactly the bounty they will spend to get a new customer. And when you do so, you effectively change advertising from a discretionary expense, you move it up the income statement to a cost of goods sold. And when you do, uh, media becomes always on. There is no campaign off. When Uber says to App Lovin', I want more customers and I'll pay you X for all new qualified Uber customers, App Lovin' doesn't say, so do you want like 50,000? You want like 100,000? Uber's like, no, 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 I'll take all comers. So quite literally, these companies are drinking from the fire hose. I don't know why that's a good thing. It looks painful. Um, and another thing happens when you move migrate towards performance. Whether you use DR terms or brand terms doesn't matter. It's the same concept. We're getting away from proxies and towards business outcomes. And that jacks the operating leverage. This, ladies and gentlemen, is why venture capitalists are interested in this category. Venture capitalists don't invest in shoe manufacturers, but they do DTC because it's a fundamentally different operating leverage that looks more like a tech company. And they do content marketing and they do that well because they have a great story to tell. So the narrative of, I was frustrated with this product, so I designed my own, we got it funded, we're now in market, everybody loves it, it's a great story to tell. Uh, and as I mentioned, they've moved beyond digital to television. Look, we mostly on the coast people, uh, all of course have broadband and, and smartphones, but not the United States of America, in fact, it's only 73% penetration. So you need TV in order to fill out the rest um, of your audience. And, and OTT, the, the, the fastest growing aspect of how TV is changing, is really like a, a, a nirvana for DTC. Think about the cohort that is millennials prone to buy DTC brands. Now think about the cohort that is millennials uh, uh, who subscribe to OTT. Well, it's the same cohort. Uh, the overlap is incredible. In fact, the IAB's report uh, noted that there's a 2x propensity of um, <clears throat> millennials to buy DTC brands, or sorry, so, uh, 
um, uh, streaming uh, subscribers to buy DTC brands. So this connection uh, is in fact real. And in fact, <clears throat> what, what they're doing here is they're leveraging all of the aspects of digital, like targeting and personalization, attribution and performance, to the big screen where you've got sight sound in motion, audience and spend scale, premium inventory, and brand safety. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the greatest opportunity in marketing's history, period. I, 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 not an overstatement. So, I know what you're thinking. Can, Terry, can any marketer do it? Can we get in on the fun? Can we be the fourth incarnation to this natural gestation? Well, let's go to the tape, shall we? Uh, let's see, here are seven attributes to see if traditional marketers can join in on the DTC fun. Number one, digital native mobile centric survey says, mm. of course not, don't be silly. Uh, focus on product design, UX, sure you could do that. Uh, disintermediation, mm. no, your models are set. How about number four, identity focused customer relationship. Mm. You don't even know who your customers are. Think about it. How could you possibly do identity-based customer relationship when you don't know who your customers are? Performance-oriented media spend. So, so technically, yes, but I'm gonna have to, no, shrink it. No, smaller, smaller, smaller. Okay, that's about right. Um, yes, you could migrate towards performance-oriented media spend, but let's face it, the whole frickin' ecosystem is set up the other way. So it's just not gonna happen, okay? Uh, it's all based on impressions and CPM, the whole world. Uh, content marketing for brand storytelling, absolutely, and some uh, of the traditional marketers do this phenomenally well. How about growth-focused marketing talent? This is a yes, but it comes with an asterisk that may require personnel change. Why do I say that? Well, there is a vast difference between the talent uh, of a traditional CMO versus that of a DTC brand CMO. I'm sorry, we're gonna have to start with some nomenclature change. Spend doesn't matter in DTC land, just results. These are not CMOs, these are chief growth officers. Uh, the age is a generation apart. The uh, backgrounds are diametrically opposed. Now the good stuff, compensation. These look wholly different. The traditional CMO, uh, a huge cash heavy compensation, understandable, they live in, uh, Greenwich, Connecticut, they've got three kids in private school, drive the latest Beamer, country club membership, and maybe an alimony payment or two to fund. So yeah, I get it, they need the cash. Now the hipster in Brooklyn, who's getting by on a subsistence salary, has got a huge vig on performance and a boatload of options so that if the company sells, they cash in big time. So think about it, the compensation leverage of this talent is fundamentally different. Okay, so. Generally speaking, there are two strategy options for growth for traditional marketers. You could do build or you could do buy. Let's take a look. I'm gonna go ahead and suggest that it is incredibly hard, almost impossible for legacy marketers to build DTC brands. Take Razors, for example. Dollar Shave Club launches in 2010 with an innovative business model and a coolness factor. Remember Mike Dubin in that viral video? Are the blades any good? No. Our blades are f***ing great. So not only did he produce this video with like no cash, cost him like, you know, five grand, uh, it garnered over 25 million views and organically. Didn't pay a dime to uh, make that uh, go viral. So what did the number one market share company, Gillette, in razors do in response to the launch of Dollar Shave Club? They launched Gillette Shave Club, a copycat business model that screams inauthenticity. It's almost like they don't want you to buy their razors. Exactly, Mike. I mean, and by the way, if you marketers are sitting out there, you still think you can be cool and like launch your own DTC brands? Think about a middle-aged white man trying to dance. Yep. It's like a slow motion car wreck. You can't look away. So for all you marketers who think you've got it, you can do this, I want you to let this image burn into your brain and let the governor be your governor.
This is my last slide. We're just gonna stand here for the next hour. No. I mean, it just, it really. Um, and very few incumbents have had success with DTC, right? Think about it. The ones that have are the best marketers to begin with. And it even took them major initiatives or reorganizations in order to ensure that this worked. Okay, so fine. So maybe build is not best. Maybe we need to think about buy. And by the way, this comes with a caveat. As an investment bank, you know, Luma often calls for more M&A because when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So with that caveat, and here are the 10 and only 10 uh, sizable transactions in the DTC space. Deals over $100 million. Couple things to note here. Number one, the defensive rationale deals, that is to say, where the acquirer was already in the category of the target, have been done at valuation multiples that, that are double or triple the underlying uh, vertical. The offensive uh, rationale deals are being done at like tech multiples, five, 10x, even greater uh, times revenue. And don't worry, I know I said some things about Gillette, but Mark is not sweating it, P&G is not sweating DDC, they're going native. They bought native deodorant for $100 million. So they understand the opportunity and are getting in uh, the game. Uh, here's a couple case studies, Unilever buying Dollar Shave Club. This stands for the proposition that if you make a funny video with 164 million of venture capital in six years, you can turn that into a billion dollars where the buyer is happy. I'm no Vanderbilt, but this train makes hay. Yeah, may, hold on the Vanderbilt thing, Mike, because turns out sales flatlined right after the acquisition. Now, there's a lot of things going on here. They're trying to internationalize the brand, lots of other movement. And I, I, I hope it'll have a good success, but maybe, maybe it's not Vanderbilt, Mike. Maybe you're more like Billy Joe and Bobby Sue. And to be fair, he took the money, but he hasn't run yet. Still at Unilever and still uh, working to make that a, a big success. The other one, Walmart buying Jet. When this came out, all the press said they're crazy. They've lost their minds spending $3 billion on one of these companies. All the press was negative. And guess what? A year later, some of the same publishers saying the exact opposite. This is a huge uh, opportunity for them, making Mark Lore the world's best compensated Walmart greeter. Okay. So maybe uh, M&A works. And by the way, we may see these companies be sort of like the next century's sort of conglomerate. Um, okay, so fragmentation is a challenge to find the targets. I mean, here's the DTC brand Lumascape that'll be published today. Again, lumapartners.com, you wanna go, go grab that and see all these brands. But you could look, this comes with a warning. Like the enterprise Lumascapes, there's gonna be a lot of failure here, so you have to like invest uh, wisely. And you could stare at this all day long and just get blurry eyed, but don't worry, help is coming. Like in the enterprise space, we try and find clarity. Okay, yeah, right. All right, so this is why, remember Victor Kayam, he liked the razor so much he bought the company? Why we at Luma are doubling down on consumer brands, advice for consumer brands. And I, uh, you know, look, we've been doing this for a long time with consumer brands, but this is a big new initiative, and I am super excited that besides uh, 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 very qualified people that we have internally, I am today announcing, oh my God, I'm so excited, the biggest name in marketing and technology today is joining Luma. Ladies and gentlemen, say hello to Luma's latest advisory board member, Mr. Scott Galloway, joining Luma. Woo! For this very effort, it's uh, going to be uh, amazing, uh, along with the rest of the Luma team. Okay, so... Bringing it home, looking forward, you marketers have a choice to make. You could take the red pill and pursue DTC-led innovation, or you could take the blue pill and go back to marketing as usual. Well, let's see, pick the blue pill and you know, forget about this talk, you didn't sign up for this shit, just go back to spray and pray, hope for the best. Besides, retirement's coming up soon. And by the way, if you find yourself in this cohort, and I suspect there are many of you who do, I have really good news. Cocktails in Concert tonight with Kelly Clarkson. Brought to you by iHeartMedia. Drink, enjoy the music, and forget everything I just said. Or, could get serious. Take the red pill and see how deep the DTC rabbit hole goes. 
study these best practices, focus on the consumer, recommit to product design, utilize leading customer identity solutions, adopt performance media, deploy content marketing, make select acquisitions, and while you're at it, don't forget number eight, get your raise and promotion because you have just invigorated growth into your institution. Or as Rihanna says, bitch, better have my money. And yeah, I'm going personal because I, remember, I started personal. Don't worry, you take enough of these red pills, you can wipe that out. So, my advice, choose wisely. And if you do choose the red pill, you do pursue DTC-led growth, maybe make a few acquisitions, well, in the words of Mike Dubin, the party is on. So, So I get, we're running off. I'm really looking forward to the Q&A, but Bill, I, I, before we do the Q&A, just a quick disclosure. You know, at Luma, we are agents that facilitate business investment. So we're agents for facilitating business investment. We're agents for FBI. Bring it on. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, so even before I saw the two pills up there, yeah. my question, help us all. What type of vitamins do you take? You know, I need to do that to get the energy. So, so, I, I'm only allowed so, one coffee. So, so turn around, somebody take this picture. If you walk around with this jacket, there's something else going on with the FBI you guys may have read about in the trade <laughs> press. You'll scare the hell out of a lot of people. So, Hey, listen, yeah. <laughs> I'm joking, but they're not. Yeah, so so very, very little time for questions. So. Yeah. Uh, um, so a direct-to-consumer brand cuts out the middlemen. You had a slide up there where you mentioned agencies. Just yeah. talk broadly about, in, in a and I've seen this huge trend toward marketers yeah. taking that in-house. So what do you see for direct-to-consumer brands? So here's the thing. Agencies are stuck in, a, in an old business model. I mean, they're good people. I, I wish them well. Uh, and as Rashad Tabakawala says, they're like cockroaches. They'll figure out a way to survive. And many of them have. The smarter, more technology-enabled ones on the enterprise side have found a way to live in this new world. I'm looking at you, Dave Smith. Uh, and secondly, is in this specifically in DTC, we have now seen the rise of DTC agencies. Sounds like an oxymoron, but literally they are, they are specialized in these DTC strategies. So Jeff Bezos is the great disruptor, and he had a line that he said, someday someone will come and disrupt us. Can you look into a crystal ball when you think about direct-to-consumer brands and, again, just emerging? Yeah. But what should be the watch-outs for those guys? So it's, it's interesting you, you say know, that because Dollar Shave Club uh, garnered 12% uh, market share against Gillette, or them and Harry's, I think, uh, garnered over 12%. Now they're getting disintermediated by yet newer DTC brands. So what I think we're going to see is a continued fragmentation and splintering uh, of these brands as more and more of them grow, uh, grow up and appear. So uh, in your role as an investment banker, you have great visibility to what's going on in the industry. So besides DTC, what are some um, hot things that you've seen that you'd like to share with the crowd? Well, what's interesting about this DTC thing, again, if you go back to the sort of the, the seven elements of their DNA is what I would encourage other marketers to do is take a look at what they're doing. Things like CDPs, where you truly have a holistic understanding of who your customer is. You can uh, manage what to do with them across every channel throughout the customer journey. And uh, so study how they're reaching their success. Because yes, many of those can be applied to marketing writ large. So final question for you. Um, you're the inventor of the Lumascape. Yeah. How many Lumascapes are there now? And besides the new one you're introducing today, which one's your favorite? Ah, so there's 21 uh, Lumascapes now. We're just coming out with the audio uh, uh, Lumascape. Um, there is uh, the direct-to-consumer. Uh, so there's 21 in total. By far my favorite is the strategic buyer Lumascape. Uh, it's colorful. It's got 200 logos on there of all the major buyers in media, marketing, technology, and network. Uh, and and they're cut, it's cut five different ways. So if you're selling product to companies, that's a good one to utilize. You're just awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it.